When a loved one receives a diagnosis that will require you to become their caregiver, life will never be the same. The journey of a caregiver is perhaps one of the most difficult jobs you'll ever have, but it doesn't need to consume you if you learn some of these simple self-care habits. My next guest is a certified business coach and a master life coach who has spent two decades helping people and organizations in every sector of the economy, both in rural and urban areas. Helping others is in her blood, and so it's no surprise that she devoted herself to becoming a caregiver in her personal life, too. Many people lose their identity while caring for a loved one. They often forget to care for themselves. This is what happened to my next guest, and she'll share her story. Welcome, Mary Morrison. Hi, Deborah. So good to be with you always. This journey, this being a caregiver journey, would you like to share a little bit of your story with us? I'd love to. As you said in the lovely intro, I always, always like to help other people. And if anyone can learn from my experience, then I would definitely want to share my my story. Uh, As you have heard, I'm a life coach and a business coach. And the last thing in the world I would ever have imagined would that would be that I could lose my center, that I could lose myself in a situation that I, I basically lost Mary. Uh, and I had both feet planted firmly on the ground. My partner had a uh, quadruple bypass, and shortly after that, he um, was diagnosed with dementia. And this man was just the most intelligent, fun-loving guy that you'd ever want to meet. Fortunately, he um, was always happy. That isn't what happens all the time. So I, I was really lucky that way. One of the things that happens, I guess, is called participatory grief. You have the diagnosis. And I remember the day that we got the diagnosis at the Western Hospital. And we both looked at each other and little did we know what the journey was going to entail. And we got to, I think the saddest part is watching the life that you want to know slowly begin to disintegrate difficult sometimes for people to relate. So our social time was uh, started to become quite narrow. I'm so fortunate that we lived in the Alliston area and there is an absolutely wonderful hospice, leading art, uh, called Matthew's House. And so I heard from my neighbor about Matthew's House. George and I had just moved into the Alliston area from the country. And um, I joined a course for Caregivers 101. And I remember sitting at that table and not knowing a soul and thinking how lucky I was to be so around these, these people that were going through the same thing. And I remember uh, at noon of the first session, I looked around the table and thought, oh, would it ever be nice to go with someone and have some lunch and, and just talk out of the uh, formal setting? George was going to the VOM pro, uh, program, and that's something I'd like to suggest to people. Um, there is a day program for people uh, like George or have um, illnesses. And George went three days a week. It gave me a break. It was wonderful for him. It gave him a lot of st- stimulation and it added a lot of structure to our life as well. Mm-hmm. I just mentioned a VOM program. I am sure that this sort of thing is available in any country almost. Um, It was a program where participants would go and be with others. They would do stimulating things, play games, talk, and keep their minds active. They danced. Uh, Dancing and music is so good for anyone with dementia. So um, that gave me a break, and it was so good uh, for George as well. 
And so for for yourself, it, it's really important what I've been learning for caregivers to have some time for yourself. It's essential. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, self-care is, is number one. And the problem is you, you become a caregiver, a caretaker, and you slowly, and I, I, I suppose this was really our, our intended focus, Deborah, is that slowly, slowly lose yourself. You're so used to, my day would start with, uh, good morning, George, time to get up. Okay, George, here, here are your clothes. Um, I've got them beside the shower now, honey. Um, time to get in the shower. Okay, come on, let's come and have some breakfast. Oh, goodness, your ride's going to be here. So we better hurry and make sure you brush your teeth then. Oh, here's your coat. I hope you have a wonderful day. And mm -hmm. I often joke with the girls who were caregivers as well and said, I don't think I'll ever have another relationship. I've become too bossy. <laughs> oh, that's what it appeared to be. <laughs> well, that, and we talk about self-care and I look, would look forward to the days when I had time off. But as I became more immersed in this, I was too tired. I was, mm. this was a 24 seven deal. And all of a sudden I was too tired and I, I was starting to get into trouble then. And how things um, move forward, and this, uh, I just would like to show people how important it is to be careful. Mm -hmm. I burned out and ended up in the hospital with a virus and uh, was dehydrated, was in intravenous for five days. Now, that's how scary it can be. I didn't have a, a family support system. Uh, I had wonderful caregiver support, but I didn't have family support. And so there's never a time, you know, a time out or a time off, except for those days uh, going to VON. But there's always a lot to do during that time. So mm -hmm. I, I just slowly, I just slowly lost Mary. Wow. And my spiritual base has always been so important to me. And I, I found I, it was hard even to get to that place, to get to a place of med meditation. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I've learned, um, I was doing some research on this, and one of the suggestions was to connect to activities that fill your soul. And that's what you've just been mentioning is, you know, you you maybe used to do some meditation, but um, you were so tired or distracted and that you couldn't get in, get into that. Um, was, was that the entire case? Or was there something that you did that allowed you to have that space for yourself? I did for a long time. Yes, I would. I, I love to drive. And so I would get in the car and I would go to places. I was in a new area and I would drive and look at beautiful scenery and put the music on and sing and uh, just do what. And I love nature. So I you know, would go for walks. Uh, I, I, the, the, and, and also, you know, maybe to go and have lunch with somebody and a glass of wine and uh, and not whine, but talk about, pardon the pun, and not and talk about fun stuff, talk about girly stuff. Mm -hmm. Things other than the, the yes. caregiving that took up all your time. Exactly. So, so being a, a caregiver for others, so helping people, being a life coach and a business coach. And so you did have some experience of putting other people first and focusing on them. But there's a lot of people out there that find themselves in the caregiving position that have had no experience in that at all. Is there anything Absolutely. that you can, can share about that with us? My biggest learning out of all of this, and I am so grateful to have had this opportunity to learn one more thing about something that is uh, it's heartbreaking for families to watch a family member slowly disappear from um, our lives. And I, I'm just so grateful that I've had the opportunity. Um, I think probably the biggest thing that I've learned, Deborah, is to ask for help. I never, ever, I was always, I'll do it myself. I'm fine. I can do it. People want to be of service. They want to help you. And so I, I've learned now. I, I don't hesitate if I need some help. I get it. I've had two hip replacements and that certainly put me in a place where uh, just recently, and that's put me in a place where I had no choice but to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing is about perspective. I think that it's so important to be willing to um, be open and, and look at things from another way. You, you really learn, I, I suppose, the language. It's so important not to criticize them because inside that person, 
is someone who still cares and hears somehow. And um, the last thing in the world they need to be is put down. And that's where rest is important because you don't want to get irritated. Mm -hmm. The other point that, um, that I think is really important is that you can't give from an empty vessel, can you? Most definitely not. Absolutely not. And I would recommend people finding support. It's out there a lot more than it ever has been before. You have to have the support system. I journaled um, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and we lived in a place where I could just practically go out in the backyard and go for a walk, which was lovely. Um, but honestly, Deborah, at the end, I was just too tired to do anything. And uh, I would encourage anybody in this situation to be careful not to let that happen. Mm -hmm. And so you did find your balance eventually, did you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I've relocated and I'm, um, I think that my journey as a result of all this, because I was exhausted to hip replacement, to move the loss of my partner, um, really, I, I needed to process a lot of information. And as I mentioned, I'd sort of lost my center about that. So it took a while before I was able to um, get into that nice, peaceful place. Um, one of the things that helped me a whole lot is the sages uh, Tao Te Ching, uh, ancient advice for the second half of your life. And it's just talk, you know, talks about... Uh, just letting go and accepting uh, our age and stage and uh, really that we're all just fine if we would trust that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been the biggest joy for me. COVID has forced that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm now in a new uh, location and meeting new people and my life is good. That's awesome. That it's not that it took three years, but it's awesome that you found your way back again. So, yes. um, having had that experience, um, would you say that was the hardest job you've ever had? Yes, I would definitely say that. Um, I, I used to um, talk to some of the gals and they'd say, I don't know who I am anymore. And if I could ever help people, I would love to help them um, find that person and realize that you now have a purpose and that you have so much to give and so much to receive and receiving is a lot of fun women have oftentimes um, especially when you're getting into these stages uh, but women weren't doing as much as women are doing now so in some instances some of the gals I met at our caregiver group had never had a job so um, just helping people find purpose and joy and uh, life after all of this. Mm -hmm. It's all about balance too, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But again, um, so many women just gave, gave, gave. And uh, once the family was gone, they, what's my role anymore? And I think with um, becoming a caregiver, that's exactly what happens. Sometimes when, you know, you're an empty nester and you say, oh boy, what now? Um, that's, that's exactly what happens with the, the dementia walk. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, uh, if people find themselves on the other side of caregiving, um, recognizing that they need to give care to themselves now. Uh, I know you'd mentioned about journaling and I'm wondering if journaling would be a good way for, for us to, really find out how we're feeling about things so that we can see what it is we're working with or who needs the help right now and why. Uh, I agree. And, and a lot of people don't know about journaling. I've been doing it because I love to write. I've been doing it for a long time. But anybody just starting out and looks at the paper and says, now what? Just um, let your hand go. Let Just let your hand go across the paper and it'll be scribbles. And sometimes as you go on and on and on, those scribbles became, become bigger and harder and you can feel emotions coming out like crazy. The mm -hmm. other thing is, you know, when you feel like you're going to burst and you don't know what to do about it, go and pound a pillow and say whatever, because this is not an easy walk for anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
even though it is so difficult and we lose ourselves, we can easily lose ourselves, the perspective of what it is you're doing and why you're doing it, I think that's something that we need to keep a focus on somehow, like the the privilege of being able to help somebody that really needs your help um, is is really a blessing to, to be in a position, right? To be in a position to to give that help to somebody that, that they couldn't do it any other way. As I said, I was really, really fortunate. George was a happy guy and uh, he appreciated everything I did for him. And it was it was a um, privilege, as you said, it was such a privilege to be able to be there. And we our relationship was always really good, but it became better in a different way because it really was just the two of us. And you learn your own language. It's, it's a different language all of a sudden. And uh, music was something that really helped us. That never changed with George and he always had lots of rhythms. So we dance. And um, just trying to keep that connection going. He get, became quite tired and, um, you know, he was a highly intelligent man, loved to communicate, loved to joke. So some of those things began to disappear, but we found other things that um, got, got us through. We both loved nature so much and loved to cook. So that became a focus. And we just, we just, we'd go for drives. I'd drive. It was, um, as I say, it was a privilege. Mm-hmm. And adaptability is a willingness to adapt to the new norm, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. I guess that's where the participatory grief comes in. Um, you know, once you get the diagnosis that your life is about to change forever. And so you're grieving the whole time this person is still with you. Mm-hmm. So participatory grief, can you share with our listener what that is? Well, it's knowing. Participatory grief is the shared grief of knowing that life will never be the same, that this diagnosis is very real and that your partner is going to change in a lot of different ways. And um, and also trying to keep a good attitude uh, because it's important for both to have a good attitude. Mm-hmm. People can, can get very, very depressed about this. And if a person gets a cancer diagnosis to explain participatory grief, everybody involved with that person is participating in the grief that this this person may not be with us. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful, Deborah? Absolutely. So so you're doing your best, but you're still in a grief mode because you know what's down the line, right? Yeah. Well, I began, I always have been... um, kind of a chatty Kathy and a big sparkle in my eyes. I love life. And I began to lose my sparkle. And bit by bit, I, I suppose, a form of depression. Mm -hmm. Again, though, I I, just a joy. And the, the beautiful part for us was we had talked about next steps. We together went to look at long term care facilities together. We chose everything. Doing the due diligence is is essential because the day will come. And with our system today, if you're not in the slot, then um, it can get pretty uncomfortable. So, Mary, are there any organizations that you know of that can guide people through that process? Or did you have to discover it by yourself? No. Well, I was lucky because I'd heard about Matthew's house, uh, the hospice. There's one in Barrie, but they're all over the world uh, and they have support programs. Uh, And I had taken the Caregiver 101 to learn um, how to deal with this. And it was excellent, just uh, top notch. I think there might have been eight or 10 modules. And we had guest speakers, people that came and talked about finances and how to get your will and powers of attorney and so on. You just Google to find out resources for um, because they're going to be different in every location. And there's an Alzheimer's Society as well. A lot of people are under the impression that hospice is about death and dying, and and it isn't. It's about end of life in a most wonderful way with your family all around you. But it also, um, I found with Matthew's house that it was uh, support for anybody that had a chronic condition or their their partner. As a result, Deborah, there are nine of us uh, gals that were caregivers, 
And we are called the Sparkles and we Zoom every <laughs> Tuesday afternoon. And three are no longer living in the area. One's in Nova Scotia, I'm here in Aurelia. And uh, uh, we have another one down in Whitby, but we still get together every week because that was our common bond and, and we all, we're all on the other side of it now. Right. So you, you made uh, a support group between Absolutely. you and, yes. and you're still supporting each other even now. And we went at, we would uh, probably three times a year, maybe four, we'd get together for either grow for dinner or um, one of our special friends who has a room, uh, a dining room big enough to handle all of us. And we have a lot of fun. And how did you find these women? Were they already your friends or? No, uh, actually, I sat I sat on a Friday at this Caregiver 101 and I looked around the room and there was, I, I would so have loved to go for lunch with someone because I didn't know a soul. So the next week I went back and I said, okay, I don't care what age you are, but if you have a sparkle in your eye, I'm going to invite you for <laughs> dinner. And so I think to start, there might have been four or five of us and now we're nine. Wow, I love that. <laughs> If you have well, a sparkle it, in your eye. <laughs> yeah. And, and, oh, look, we've had so much fun, so much fun. And when I moved, um, I got a picture of all of us and, you know, everybody signed it. It's just, just so nice to have that bond. And it's essential to find that kind of support. Wow. So in this whole journey, you must have grown as, as a person. How, how has it changed you? Uh, I'm a lot calmer. I'm a lot more confident. I have my confidence back. I live in the moment much more. I'm grateful every day I wake up. And uh, I, I'm just joyful, joyful all the time. Beautiful. It was quite a walk. And, and I'm, I'm just grateful that I had the experience and grateful that I now have a bit of time for myself. And the sparkle is back in your eyes. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, wonderful. I learned to laugh again, and it's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing uh, all of that information and, and all of your journey with us. My pleasure. It's always so nice to spend time with you, Deborah. And so for those that are listening, so caregiving might be the hardest job you've ever done in your life, but it is also your greatest privilege. So every challenge and every experience, it's actually working for your own personal growth and it can mold your character and even show you a side of yourself that's been wanting to come out all along. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you've heard and want to hear more, please subscribe, leave a comment and a rating, and I promise to send good vibes your way. <laughs>